All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Felicia Fuller and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a few basic details for today with today's webinar. To limit the background noise, all attendees have been muted. As we go through today's webinar, please feel free to send any questions you may have through the questions panel, which should be located on the right-hand side. Of we will have a short Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. We will try and answer as many questions as possible given the time that is left. We will respond to any questions we don't get to via email. Thank you again for signing up for GBRI's free webinar. We have had over 1,800 registrants for today's webinar. While we, wait, while we wait for others to join, GBRI is an online sustainability education provider founded with the belief that the best way to encourage responsible development is to provide resources to the builders, designers, and engineers who are crafting our future. Our mission is to make sustainability resources affordable and accessible to everyone across the globe. With this mission in our mind, we have introduced webinars with suggested pricing where one can access it for free if they are facing hardship or watching it to enhance their knowledge. Other than hundreds of courses geared towards sustainability, we have best in class exam prep for LEED Green Associate lead AP and well AP. Don't let the pandemic keep you away from where you want to be. GBRI has introduced a unique scholarship program for students and sustainability professionals from around the world. This is our way, this is one of our ways to be part of the solution. To expedite the process, there is no application process like there normally would be. Instead, GBRI encourages interest, inter, interested applicants to use the honor system. On this page, we have listed a few scholarship codes that applicants can use when registering for their CE or exam prep courses. Depending on the code applicants enter, the shopping cart will automatically reduce the out-of-pocket costs by 30 to 100%. At this time, users can get up to 50% off CE packages and up to 100% off for all exam prep packages. This scholarship is GBRI's way of thanking you and recognizing your perseverance in the face of adversity. We hope this token of love and support will help you stay on track with the important work you do, despite the disruptions. To learn more about GBRI's scholarship program, you can visit www.gbrionline.org scholarship and we'll be sure to share this link with you guys in the chat. Let's get started. With more than 50 million cases and over a million deaths as of the beginning of November, COVID-19 does not need an introduction anymore. As more states get ready to reopen businesses and schools, it is imperative that building managers, school superintendents, and facility managers are equipped with up-to-date HVAC strategies while operating their newly opened facilities. Let's look at some HVAC operation strategies that will help mitigate the transmission of respiratory infections such as COVID-19. Today's webinar has been approved for one LEED and WELL general hour and one AIA HSWLU. It may also count for CE credit towards other organizations. However, you would need to check with them directly. Certificates of completion will be sent out via email within one week. You will also see your CE hours automatically reported to your transcripts within 72 hours. If you forgot to provide your reporting information or need to update the reporting information you sent us, please email us at info at gbrionline.org or send your updated information um, in the follow-up email that we'll send out. You can respond to that and send it there as well. Our 
I'm sure many of you may already be familiar with today's instructor, Jeslyn Vargas. Jeslyn is once again actively teaching with GBRI. Jeslyn is the Director of Project Controls in the Program Controls Division of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority's Construction and Development Department, overseeing multi-mega projects in New York City, including the East Side Access Project, a commuter rail project that at $11 billion is one of the largest transportation projects in the world. Jeslyn has over 16 years of professional experience in, this, in sustainability and project controls. His experience spans teaching, planning, problem solving, strategy development, risk assessment, CPM scheduling, performance monitoring, building and managing teams, and project management. He has gained his experience by working on a wide variety of projects in the United States, India, Taiwan, and the Middle East. An avid believer in sustainability and volunteering, he is also active with his nonprofit, iBelieve.org, where he supports education projects in India and Africa. Jeslyn holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the College of Engineering Trivandrum in India and a master's degree in construction management from Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. I would now welcome today's instructor, Jeslyn. Thanks, Felicia. Looks like, you know, we have around uh, 800 attendees now, and I can see from the questions here, some are having issues with their audio. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, let's see, um, many of, I mean, let me see if the solution. So some of our attendees are saying open Zoom and click on join meeting using the ID. So which we can do right now here, uh, we're gonna actually share the Zoom meeting directly. That way you have it. Give me a second. We're going to actually include that in our chat. Maybe Felicia, you can. Uh... Yeah, I'm going to include that in the chat. So in case you're having issues, you can directly click that link. Then chat should take care of uh, the audio issue. All right, then. Thank you again for joining us today. My name is Jesslyn, and I'm excited to present uh, the research uh, topic I did a few weeks ago. So through this webinar today, we will look at the role of social interactions in the spread of COVID-19, understand the role of HVAC in creating an ambient indoor environment quality, analyze the role of HVAC in the context of COVID-19, and learn HVAC operation and strategies to prevent the transmission. Uh, let me continue. All right, so looks like the audio issue is resolved for many of. Perfect, thanks. Why can't I go out? Why can't I just hang out with my buddies in the bar just like good old days? Depending on which part of the world you are in now, you may be already tired of COVID and the COVID shutdown. I'm sure many of us, including myself, have had this thought in the first few months when we were all wondering what was going on. I have felt the urge to get out more often than I do now, but have controlled myself and rather self-negotiated for the larger good. As Felicia mentioned while, in, while introducing the course, with more than 50 million cases and over a million deaths, COVID-19 does not need an introduction. While in the beginning, we thought there is no human-to-human -human transmission, in a few months, we have learned it is contagious and even seen the signs in our pets and animals. I'm sure you read about the tiger Nadia, in Bronze Zoo that got tested positive. It just shows that it is still new and we don't yet know what we are fighting. I have been tracking the COVID numbers in New York City for a construction workforce analysis study for the MTA. 
And in the beginning, we have had around 100 cases in March. And fast forward to this week in November, we are close to 300,000 cases and more than 24,000 deaths. That's one of the worst hit cities in the world. You can see the corresponding numbers for the US and the world below. As you can see from the graph here, there was a time we had it under control with around 200 to 300 new cases. I'm talking about New York City. But as of, past, as of this past week, the number of positive cases are continuing to go up. It's like in the thousands now. Winter is fast approaching in the Northern Hemisphere and researchers and mathematicians who model disease spread in Harvard, they warn that COVID-19 outbreaks are likely to get worse especially in regions that don't have this in control. Infections caused by many respiratory viruses, including the flu and some coronaviruses, they swell in winter. While we don't know yet whether COVID virus is going to be seasonal, based on our past experiences and on the basis that how people behave in colder months, there's a good chance that the number will go up. If you think about it, holidays are coming and we all would be interacting more often indoors in places with poor ventilation, which will increase the risk of transmission. Now, I am healthy and I may not get it, or I may not get very sick. Many of us had the thought, right? Let's hold that thought for a second. I'm sure Many of us are aware of the 1918 flu that took the lives of over half a million Americans and between 50 and 100 million around the world. Perhaps we have the advantage of hindsight that policymakers didn't have back then. But back then, we didn't have the people move all around the world like we do now. On the screen now, you're looking at the number of flights at this moment in America. Imagine all the flights and traveling that happened in and out of New York in the first few weeks on the epidemic. The world is flat in many a case, and this definitely worked against us when fighting an epidemic. Hence, the number of cases grew exponentially in a matter of weeks. Here's a snapshot of the John Hopkins COVID Resource Center from March 9th. Can you believe we had around 800 cases in the beginning of March in the US and around 100,000 in the world? A month later, April 6, more than a million around the world and 350,000 in New York alone. Fast forward to October 7th. This was when originally I was planning to give this webinar. 35 million cases around the world. I took the screenshot because originally we planned this webinar on October 15th. And guess what? In one month, we're close to 50 million cases around the world with 1.2 million deaths. That's a 40% increase in new cases as compared to last month. Well, what does it all tell us? I'm sure it's not breaking news. We way underestimated COVID-19. While some of us thought, why stay home? Here's a model from Washington Post that shows what would have happened if all all of us just hung around like good old times. And what happens if we practice social distancing? It is true, it's an inconvenience for all of us to stay stuck, not being able to socialize or go to watch a movie or show. But thank you, thank you all for doing your part, for stopping the spread by staying indoors and by doing social distancing and wearing a mask, of course, when you're outside in the public. While we're at it, looks like the virus, this is again a recent news, the, the virus ignores the outdated six feet social distancing measure. October 21st, the CDC updated its definition that the virus could travel beyond six feet of an infected person. So to close my thought on social distancing, while you may be healthy, or even if you are a superman or superwoman, the point is you could still be carrying it along with you and giving it to the people who, you, who are vulnerable with your social interaction. 
by staying in as needed, maintaining social distancing, wearing a mask, but doing all of this, we are helping the vulnerable from getting sick and also helping the army of men and women who are on the front line. At this time, I definitely want to thank, million thanks to all the brave men and women around the world on the front line. This includes healthcare workers, first responders, grocery and restaurant staff members. We need them all. And I urge you all to support your local businesses during times like this. Now that we understand the role of social interactions in the spread of COVID-19, let's look into heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, how it affects the indoor environment. HVAC systems, as we all know, both whole building and, and standalone systems, it delivers clean air by exchanging indoor and outdoor air, removing extra heat, humidity, and contaminants, thereby providing an ambient indoor environment. HVAC systems play a crucial role in maintaining an ambient IEQ, considering the fact that we spend more than 90% indoors. Unknown to many is the concentration of many pollutants that are often two to five times higher inside our buildings than outdoors. This is according to the EPA. This is due to a variety of reasons, including cooking, smoking, cleaning, volatile organic compounds from building materials, paints and furnishings. You heard it right, even cooking. Simply put, cooking is an act of controlled combustion. Emissions of nitrogen dioxide in homes with gas stoves exceed the EPA's definition of clean air in an estimated 55 to 70% of those homes. You may wonder why we are not noticing it. Because we're used to the smell and hence we don't think it is an issue. VOC levels or concentrations are often higher indoors up to 1,000 times than outdoors, making the in indoor environment a cause for building-related illness or sick building syndrome. I'm sure you might have heard these, uh, these acronyms while studying for your LEAD or well AP exams. Though these three three-letter acronyms sound alike, there is a subtle difference. The symptoms of BRI or building related illness can be directly attributed to, to airborne building contaminants. Whereas for sick building syndrome, although the symptoms can be linked to time spent in a building, no specific illness or cause can be identified. Bottom line, ventilation is recognized as an important factor influencing the transmission of airborne diseases and therefore the role of HVAC system is crucial, not only for the comfort of the building occupants, but also for their health, safety, and well-being. Now, as building professionals, let us talk about the connection between COVID-19 and HVAC and understand how we can operate buildings safely for indoor users. As you may know, poor ventilation in the past, like in, in indoor spaces, is associated with increased transmission of respiratory disease like SARS, uh, which is the, uh, severe, um, the severe SARS and the MERS, the Middle East Res Respiratory Syndrome, Syndrome. This is back in 2010. This strengthens our understanding about how these viruses behave. I'm going to show you a sketch showing arrangement of a restaurant tables and air conditioning airflow at the site of the outbreak of COVID-19. The sketch here shows the arrangement of the restaurant tables and the air conditioning airflow at the site. So red circles indicate seating of future case patients and the yellow filled circle indicates the index patient or patient zero. Based on a recent study published on the CDC website, 
during the early months of 2020, 10 individuals from three families, families A, B, and C, were infected from COVID-19, who had eaten at the same air-conditioned restaurant in Guangzhou, China, which is a five-floor building without windows. I would like you to pay attention to these tables, A, B, and C, and where the AC is mounted. This is very common when you go to a crowded restaurant, especially in cities like New York City. As you can see from the figure, families A, B, and C were sitting along the line of airflow. Others, families D and E, sitting elsewhere, not in the same line of airflow, were not infected. The authors of this report attribute the airflow generated by the AC, specifically in a recirculating mode, as a probable cause for transmission. This is also re-emphasized by the guidance document published by the European CDC, indicating if air is recirculated, it is possible for COVID-19 aerosols to spread through HVAC systems within buildings. Just for thought clarity, I thought it may help to discuss the difference between droplets and airborne uh, transmission. Large droplets are more than five microns and aerosols are less than five microns. In comparison, human air is 60 to 120 microns, which is 12 to 24 times larger than aerosol particles. So now we know that the virus that causes COVID-19 can spread from one person to another in tiny particles. We make these aerosols when we breathe and when we make more of them, when we talk, yell, or sing. Aerosols are definitely different than the droplets. The droplets are bigger and they usually fall within six feet. Here is another study where the researchers in Sweden investigated ventilation openings in one COVID-19 hospital ward. They looked at the samples, air samples from the central duct that expel indoor air from three COVID-19 wards during April and May. The central ventilation HEPA filters located several floors above the wards were removed and analyzed. And they were able to find the presence of virus in four out of 19 room vents. This indicates that the virus can be transported long distances and the droplet transmission alone cannot reasonably explain this. There are similar studies done with, which all point us to one same direction that COVID-19 can be transmitted by aerosols directly or via ventilation systems. All these studies show that there is clear evidence the virus can stay alive beyond six feet, in some cases even more than 100 feet, and they can stay in HVAC ducts and units. Considering this growing body of evidence suggesting airborne transmission as a route of infection, coupled with the knowledge of COVID-19 aerosols, it is crucial that we arm our HVAC system supporting ventilation and filtration mechanism to protect building occupants. As many states get ready to reopen businesses and schools, we have to be careful. Listed here are some of the strategies that many of you are might be familiar now. Along with this, this list, it is also imperative that building managers, schools and school supers and facility managers are equipped with HVAC transmission mitigation strategies. So let's look at some of the HVAC operation strategies. Number one, ventilation rate. We learned that indoor air has more pollutants than outdoors in many instances. And hence, dilution is the answer to pollution. How do we get there? By increasing ventilation rate. A higher ventilation rate or increasing the number of air exchanges can dilute the contaminated air inside the space more rapidly and decrease the risk of cross-infection. Using the Wells-Riley equation, 
doubling ventilation rates has the potential to reduce infection rates by half. An air exchange is how many times the air enters and exits a room from the HVAC system in one hour. In other words, it is a measurement of how many times a volume of air within a room will be added, removed, or exchanged with filtered clean air. Here is a table that shows typical air, air exchanges for many spaces. As you can see here, the air exchanges required also depend on the building use. High traffic areas will need more air exchanges per hour. So how long do you have to wait before the room is flushed and clean? The answer is it depends on the efficiency you are seeking. Here is a table from the CDC website that shows the time needed to purge airborne contaminants with 99% efficiency or 99.9% efficiency. So let's say you are able to get six air change per hour in your office space. You would need at least 45 minutes to dilute the air for a 99% efficiency. So that's, the, that's what the crux of what we're looking for to help reduce the contamination to stop the spread. Increasing ventilation rate can also be achieved by a combination of methods like natural ventilation. One thing to note here is natural ventilation alone sometimes may not be suitable for some rooms due to their depth, internal heat loads, or other factors. In these cases, some mechanical assistance can be incorporated like low powered booster fans in outlets or local comfort cooling devices. So if this is a strategy you are going to pursue, consider using indoor, fo indoor fans in combination with opening doors or windows to further enhance ventilation. As much as I advocate for increased outside air, you must avoid ventilation with outdoor air when outdoor air pollution is high or when it makes your home too cold, hot, or humid. Check your outside air quality on the airnow.gov website for the US. I'm assuming you will have similar resources in your area for those not in the US. In a mechanically ventilated building, ventilation air is typically provided by an HVAC system. Sometimes ventilation air is provided by dedicated fans or outdoor air units. For homes with window air conditioners for places like New York, you have to operate your window AC with the outlet air intake. For commercial offices and centrally air conditioned spaces, your facility manager or building manager or super can usually modify the controls to increase ventilation to a certain extent in the occupied zones without, without an additional cost. However, this is not a simple flick of a switch, as HVAC systems are complex and usually designed for individual buildings within standard specifications. Spaces where air conditioning system normally runs with recirculation mode, it may be set up to run on full outside air when possible. In many cases where dampers are not fully open, when weather permits, make sure to open the damper fully. One thing to note here is if you have a building automation system or a BMS, you may have to make sure the dampers are fully open. In many cases, the BMS will tell you one thing and the reality will be different. Now, except for healthcare facilities, most HVAC systems condition a mix of outside air with recirculated air from the same space. The recirculation of air is a measure for saving energy, but as we know, as we know, as we know now from the recent evidences that the ventilation systems could transport the airborne contaminants, including infectious viruses, from one space to another, avoid air recirculation. While it is easy for us to say 100% outside air, 
depending on your weather conditions, maximizing outdoor air intake could become a costly strategy. If that is a concern, I mean, if there are significant energy impacts from increasing outside air for ventilation, ASHRAE recommends using a minimum outside air for ASHRAE standard 62.1, along with an MERV filter three. MERV stands for minimum efficiency reporting value. We'll talk about filters in a, in a bit. Now, one may argue that MERV 13, your HVAC system will have to push harder with the pressure drop. It is true, it is true, but what I've seen from recent studies is that MERV 13 pressure drop is comparable to MERV 8 or, or not significantly high. If your home or office building has a heat recovery ventilator or ERV or HRV, keep it running. In well-designed commercial buildings, the ASHRAE recommends running the ERVs. The recircular, however, there's a concern, there's a concern of, of contamination from the energy wheel. Recirculated air from the wheel or the plate is a fraction of the total recirculation air, as you can see from the graph here. And if you have an ERV, make sure to clean and maintain your energy recovery wheel. There is an ASHRAE position document on this. We will share the link towards the end of the presentation. Ventilation is key in getting our schools safely reopened. Even if we are not facing the pandemic, good ventilation is something that we all need to flush the pollutants in our spaces. Especially when there is more activity in our space, like gyms and classrooms and school libraries. But did you know that in the US, 90% of the schools fail to meet minimum ventilation requirements? It's an issue. Dr. Joseph Allen, director of the Harvard Stan School of Public Health has been warning about. The Harvard Healthy Buildings Program has a five step guide to checking ventilation rates in classrooms. This is a document intended to offer guidance on best management practices regarding assessing the ventilation requirements in classroom. So we have the link of this one as well towards the end of the presentation. In this document, they walk you through different air change, our calculations, example calculation for ventilation rate and resources for school reopening. Just like ventilation rate, airflow direction is another key element that influence airborne transmission of diseases. The airflow direction should always be from clean zones to dirty zones. Even in your homes and offices, direct the airflow of the fan so that it does not blow directly from one person to another. Airflow direction, as I mentioned earlier, is especially crucial for healthcare facilities where this can be achieved through a pressure difference. Isolation rooms with COVID patients or, or rooms where aerosol generating procedures are performed. Those rooms should use negative air pressure. Now, in order to negative air pressure to work, it is recommended to have an anti-room or a vestibule to preserve the pressure relationship. Here is a typical pressure isolation room with anti-room and switch showing air flows and relative pressure gate. The HVAC systems of large buildings typically filter air before it is distributed throughout the building. So consider upgrading HVAC filters and enhanced filtration is critical solution to maintaining healthy indoor air quality. ASHRAE's current recommendation is to use filter with an MERV of 13. Uh, of course, MERV 14 or, or better is preferred. An MERV filter 13 is 85 to 90% efficient at capturing particles in one micron to three micron size range. On the screen now, you're looking at uh, filter efficiency for, for different filters. Generally, the higher the MERV, you get better performance. Now, if you think about it, older HVAC buildings, what would they do? For example, there are many HVAC systems that may not have the capability to support MERV 13 filters. In such cases, buildings, especially schools, should consider upgrading their HVAC systems. 
to accommodate the modern higher MERV filters, or at least use the highest MERV possible. HEPA filters are another option for enhanced filtration. HEPA filters can outperform the MERV-16 filter raising. While MERV-16 filter captures more than 95% of particles in the entire size range tested, a HEPA filter captures 99.97%. HEPA filters are so efficient, they can cause a higher pressure drop than even MERV-16 filters. And then there is ULPA filters, which stands for ultra low penetration air, which is mostly used in super clean rooms. Here is a table that I found, which is color coded, and I thought which is more user friendly. You can here you can see the MERVs on the top, MERV one through sixteen, and then below that you will see a HEPA and ULPA filters. That is for continuity. It shows, shows you the, the range and it also shows you the application. As I mentioned earlier, an M rating of 13 through 16 are higher quality filters. They require, of course, special blowers. They cannot be used in, in, in homes. It requires commercial air conditioning systems. Homes and commercial buildings could also consider portable air cleaners with high efficiency uh, filters like HEPA filters. Of course, this is definitely uh, not sufficient alone. You have to do it with a combination of measures. By themselves, these uh, portable, portable clean air cleaners and HVAC filters are not enough to protect people from the virus. When you use alongside other best management practices that we discussed earlier and, and which I'm going to discuss more. For example, for classroom spaces, the Harvard School of Public Health recommends a minimum of five air change per hour through a combination of outdoor air intake, supplemental ventilation using HEPA filters and MERV-13 filtration. Exhaust fan is another strategy, installing a vent and exhaust fan in a room to push the indoor air outside. So most homes and buildings have exhaust fans in the bathroom and sometimes in the kitchen. They can also be added to any room. Exhaust fans in bathrooms and schools or other busy buildings should always be on. UVGI is another disinfection method that uses UV light, the UV radiation to inactivate microorganisms so that they're unable to reproduce and potentially cause uh, the disease. So as you may know, the UV light belongs to the electromagnetic spectrum with a wavelength in the range of 200 to 400 uh, nanometer, which is invisible to the human eye. The UV spectrum can be subdivided into a few, few uh, subcategories like the UVA, the UVB, and C and V. So UVC is the one that we are talking about here. The efficiency of UVGI to inactivate severe acute, acute uh, the, the, SARS, the SARS virus and the MERS virus have been proven by several studies. And it is possible method for also disinfecting the, the air conditioners. Increased temperature and relative humidity can cause minimal increase in SARS-CoV decay. But the addition of simulated sunlight or UV can rapidly reduce the decay of the virus. For example, let's change the UV index here and see what happens. Right now it is four. And look at the, uh, the virus decay. So I increase it to six and you can see how the half-life came down. So this is actually uh, a tool that, which is used um, uh, as a predictive model. And you can find that actually in the Department of Homeland Security website. So we have included the link over here. And we will share that again, once again, after the presentation. The data is also published in the Journal of uh, Infectious Diseases, and it could be also found. So we will share those links as well. The study has been published in two peer-reviewed journals. Now, what is the application of UVGI within the building? So within the buildings and HVAC systems, UVC, again, UVC can be used in residential, commercial, schools, as well as healthcare facilities. Application include upper air disinfection, induct air disinfection, 
duct surface disinfection and, and room disinfection all in, in, in together. However, the use of UVC requires special PPE to limit accidental overexposure. ASHRAE also recommends the use of uh, UVC light as an enhancement where spaces require additional measures such as healthcare facilities serving vulnerable occupants or when MERV-13 filtration is not an option or when 100% outside air is not an option, uh, this is one of the strategies that ASHRAE recommends. Now, if you think about it, for any application of the UVC, it is actually a function of dose. Dose is the the length of time of exposure multiplied by the radiance. So that is one thing which has to be very uh, cognizant of. So that brings us to retro commissioning. Retro commissioning is a process to improve the efficiency of an existing building's equipment and systems. And why do I, why am I bringing this up as a strategy? If you think about it, if you are, if you have older buildings, we have all those air conditioning systems, you know, half of them may not be working, half of them may be working, but this is the time to actually think about recalibrating, recal having an audit, or at least have a person do a, a retro commissioning where you can have a step-by-step -step process on um, if you want to replace the system with a newer system, what is the payback, what is the life cycle analysis, and, and things like that. Buildings should definitely consider extending the operating times of HVACs before and after the regular period so that the system keeps running and there's more outside air. Many building HVAC systems employ energy saving settings such as demand control ventilation controlled by a timer or carbon dioxide detectors. Those strategies should be avoided as um, it limits the amount of outside air intake needed to reduce the contamination. HVAC systems also should maintain relative humidity between 40 and 60%. So as, you, as I mentioned earlier in that Department of, Department of Homeland Security modeling tool, you can go back and check what is the ideal um, humidity, temperature, and UV index for your office space. So what else can, I do? can we do? I would say continue, continue to wear masks for sure, avoiding crowded places, I, I hope your office is offering you telecommuting and I, I, am, I am pretty positive that many offices are going to continue keeping that. Social distancing, supporting your local businesses. You know, this is one time where a lot of local businesses are struggling and volunteer whenever possible. So I, I did volunteer for a couple of organizations in New York City. Uh, we volunteered for the Meals on Wheels. GBRI also uh, got 1,500 masks when it was really hard to get masks back in um, May. We got them. We had a friend who actually got us 1,500 masks. Uh, we offered that for me, the volunteers at Meals on Wheels. I also did um, volunteering with the MTA where I, where I work we, for mask distribution. Basically, we went around the subway station in the subway train and we we're offering free masks to all the uh, commuters. So these are some of the things that you can all participate in your local neighborhood to support um, the community during times like this. So to summarize, many of the strategies by themselves, for example, portable air cleaners and HVAC filters are not enough to protect people from the virus. When used alongside with other best management practice, that is when your indoor environment becomes a solid place to offer an ambient, and not only to offer an ambient environment, but also to protect the safety of the occupants. So from this picture, you can see there is micro droplets containing the virus and there is recirculation this is to be avoided. There's a UV lamp there. There is a door which is open and the ventilation and the sunlight. So it's a combination of everything. We also have some good news. I'm sure you guys have read the news. The vaccine which can prevent nine out of excuse me, nine out of 10 people getting COVID-19 is put forward for emergency approval. So I hope this virus becomes available at least by uh, next year, middle of next year for people like us. And I'm hoping that, you know, it would definitely help the people who are needed, who need it most this year itself. 
it's amazing to see what other organizations and individuals have stepped up during this pandemic. So as Felicia mentioned at the beginning, we are doing our part by offering scholarships. So on the, from this side, I had a few organizations I wanted to recognize and show what they're doing. So for example, Ashley. So the, on the screen now, you're looking at an infographic. I mean, you cannot click on this right now, but actually this infographic is completely clickable. So you can download it from the Ashes website and each of those elements would take you to what it talks about. For example, you want to learn about mitigation strategies from the UV light or filtration or outdoor air. It has got information. It has also got position documents. What is Ashray's position and guidance on those things? There are several other organizations like, for example, USCBC has introduced uh, lead pilot credits uh, in the, these lines. There are well uh, International Well Building Institute has done a lot of things. The Harvard Building, um, the uh, Public Health Department has done so many things. So we have combined them all into one section, and with the on-demand, you will get access to it. Because for the live, we thought, you know, we expanded our research. So when I originally started this research, it was only a few slides. Then, as you know, this is one of those things which is every single day things are changing. For example, tomorrow, if you go, many of the information I shared might be outdated already. So what we are doing with this webinar is anyone who is interested, we will give away the PowerPoint, the PDF to you, and you can use it as long as you give us some credit for whatever we are showing, and then you can keep improving it. So here are the list of resources. They're all, you know, once we share it to you, you can actually go to one by one. There's so many of them. All right, so back to Felicia now. Thank you, Jaslyn. Before we go, I'd like to share another free webinar that we have coming up next week. I will share the link here in the chat with you guys. Um, it is no secret that climate change is warming the air, raising sea levels and causing more severe storms and wildfires. Did you know it is also affecting human health by increasing disease, causing food insecurity and disrupting medical care? Join us as Dr. Schiller explores this topic and shares her wisdom. Climate Change and Health, a lunchtime chat with Dr. Joan Schiller, live November 17th at 12 p.m. Eastern. You can register and I'm sharing the link in the chat and we will also have a link for you guys in the follow-up email that goes out after today's webinar. Thank you, Felicia. I also see some questions on people are asking whether um, we could include hotels and resorts for the next one. So yeah, I, I didn't include that. But then again, I think that is, this is where the power of us comes into picture. You know, if we, as, you know, this is one of the reasons why we offered this webinar for free. Because we had you know close to 2,000 people who registered, and we are you know we're so excited to have you guys all. I think you know if I if I we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna record this webinar and put it on a website along with all the materials we research. And you could continue the research and we could use this on an ongoing basis. And we'll keep this webinar free. I see some questions coming in. I know a lot of people had some issues in the beginning with logging in. And so some people are asking questions about the CE credit and certificates. So um, you will receive one lead general and one well general CE hour for today's presentation, as well as one AIA HSW LU. Um, today, as long as you were watching the presentation, you will receive that CE credit. You don't need to complete a quiz or anything for that. Um, your certificate of completion will be sent out via email within one week. Any, any more questions, Felicia? I'm kind of looking here. We, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in. We'll go ahead and open the floor now for just a little bit longer. We have a little bit of time left. If you have any questions, you can type them into the um, chat panel and we will try to answer them. Um, you do not need to self-report. We will automatically report the hours for you as long as you provided your reporting information. Um, you'll see these courses, the hours for this course reported within 72 hours. If you did not submit your reporting information, you can go ahead and send that to us via email, or you can um, respond to the follow-up email that goes out after today's webinar. I will go ahead and um, put
put the email in the chat that you can send your reporting information to if you need to update that or if you need to send that to us. Thanks, Lisha. I see actually a question on portable um, filters and also the air change calculation. Um, so I think I, I had in one of the slides, I did actually show the, um, you know, the, the formula, you know, to how to calculate the air change. Um, so if you, if you, uh, if you, I mean, I, I see that many office spaces don't actually have the information on the CFM of their device, right? In such cases, what I saw is actually there's a website, I forgot the name of the website. Uh, I think it's ashe.org where there is this guy who's talking about a thermal anemometer where you can measure the air speed. So once you measure the air speed of the air coming out of your grill, multiply that with your the duct cross section. So for example, let's say you have a round duct in your office space and you measure the, um, the air speed, which is in linear feet, like, you know, feet, you know, linear feet. And then you multiply that with the area, then you will get the CFM. So once you have the CFM multiplied by that by 60, then divided by the volume of your room to get the ACH. But again, once you have the ACH, what is more important is, if you remember the table I showed you, the efficiency, how long do you have to wait before the air is completely flushed out? Now the position for um, the portable, portable uh, fans, right? So as I mentioned earlier, the, the air filters and the portable fans as such should not be considered actually one fit for all answer for this. First of all, the, the room volume is a big thing, big consideration if you should take into uh, consideration. And also, if you're sitting close to the, the fan, the HEPA filter, for example, I heard from a recent webinar that the air that comes out of HEPA filters are known to be even the purest air you can get on the earth. I forgot this person's name, but this is a webinar I attended um, an on demand version last week on the same topic. Um, so it, it looks like this was an outgrowth of the US nuclear industry, the HEPA, the, 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 uh, how the HEPA filters are, are, you know, came to action. But so, so, so the point is, if you're sitting just outside the HEPA filter where the air is pushing out, then uh, for sure you are getting actually very good air, but also it depends on uh, you know, where you, you, where you're putting it. So if for, for air conditioning spaces, I would definitely, there are HEPA filters for HVAC systems itself. Um, can older buildings support newer filters like MERV and HEPA? Um, so as indicated, older HVAC systems may not have the capacity to support MERV 13 filters. In such cases, buildings, especially schools, I think I would say consider upgrading the HVAC uh, to accommodate MERV 13 filters. Is it safe to use a UV lamp for a uh, home? I think there is uh, the, the effectiveness of the UVC lamps. So the UVC again, UVC, you know, there is A, B, and C, right? So UVC lamps in inactivating um, COVID virus is unknown because there is limited published data. Uh, however, we know that in the past, the SARS and the MERS virus, they have used it. Um, and also the, the, the dosage of the UV is also very critical. So from the, uh, I think it was, the, I'm trying to remember which website, um, uh, it's um, the FDA website where they actually have the UVC lamp link. So I think we have included that in our link, in our resources. It talks about what you can use it for, what are the safe limits and things like that. And the, the, the direct exposure of those lights could cause some skin and eye irritation. And that's the reason PPEs, PPEs are recommended. And also, um, if, the, if the virus is not on the surface, if it is covered by dust or soil, then the effectiveness of UVC is questionable. Okay, can, can we go back to the slide showing varying building use types and air change? Uh, yes, yes, let me just go back to that slide. Um, So 
So here is the, this is the slide, right, I'm talking about, which actually shows the efficiency and then the previous one where the uh, typical layer changes per hour table, yeah. So this is again for the typical one, not for the, not, not for the COVID. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it depends on the efficiency you're seeking. So I think you should use this table along with the second one for, for the best result. So the slides, right? So we are usually we give out the slides in PDF format, but if you require, you know, if you require the PowerPoint, we would be happy to share it. If you if you require the PowerPoint, please send us an email, and we will send an email. You know, we will respond to to it as soon as possible. Will you send the questions received afterwards and to everyone who attended? Yes, that is our idea. We will definitely go through the questions as I mentioned. I think I, I see right now 900 um, users. So I'm, I'm hoping, uh, you know, we'll go through the questions and we'll see, uh, we, we'll respond to the, the related ones and then post to you guys. There's also a comment from Eddie. This is not a standard anymore. Current city codes prevent indoor smoking and requires mechanical exhaust for all kitchens to terminate at the exit. Yes, that is true. I mean, there are many city codes that actually do that. That is actually very good. Oh, this is in regards to EPA claim for indoor occupants. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Felicia, back to you. Let me. All right, well, thank you so much, everyone. That will conclude today's webinar. We hope that you all enjoyed it just as much as we did. If you have any questions or if you need to get in touch with us, you can email us at info at gbrionline.org. You can give us a call at 210-858-7783, or you can chat with us over at our website, gbrionline.org. On behalf of everyone here at GBRI, thank you again for joining us today, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of y'all's day. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you all. Bye. Stay safe.